stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the fifth chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, so that it might give light to the entire house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I want to begin by just saying thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Emily and I had the opportunity with our family visiting the Townsends a couple of years ago to sit with you in worship and to enjoy that experience. And for the last two or three years, we have been talking about how hospitable your congregation was, how welcome we felt, and it is an honor to step into this place and to preach this morning. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you for all the hospitality that you lend. Even if they don't end up in the pulpit, I know that it matters to them. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The point of salt is to be salty. We are the salt of the earth. The point of light to shine. We are the light of the world. The point of life is to love. We are alive. Aren't we? Today's sermon is in two parts. Part one, Jane. Jane was a traveler, and as happens to travelers from time to time, one day Jane found herself in a new city, the city of everywhere. Perhaps you've been there. Jane had not, but being a traveler, she was up for new experiences. Plus, the city of everywhere was beautiful. The streets were clean, the architecture was so appealing, the people were so friendly. There was just one thing, one slight issue that as she walked down the street, she thought was a little off. You see, no one, not a single person she passed on the streets was wearing shoes. Strange, Jane thought as she ducked into a coffee shop. And as she was waiting for her non-fat iced latte, Looking around at all of the shoeless people, her curiosity finally got the better of her, and she said to the manager as the manager was walking by, excuse me, manager, this is my first time in your city, and I must say, it is so beautiful. The streets are so clean, the architecture is so appealing, the people are so friendly. I just have one quick question. Tell me, why doesn't anyone wear shoes? Ah. Uh, said the manager with a knowing smile. That's the question. Why don't we? Right, said Jane, like that's what I'm asking. Why aren't you wearing shoes? Don't you believe in shoes? Believe in shoes, said the manager. 
Of course we believe in shoes. It's the first article of our creed. Shoe wearing. Oh, think of the sores, the scabs, the stubs, all prevented by those wonder of wonders. Shoes. A little freaked out, Jane slowly backed out of the coffee shop with her non-fat iced latte, of course. And she was in such a state of consternation as she walked down the street that she almost didn't notice that beautiful stone building right in front of her. It had beautiful stained glass windows, maybe even one from Tiffany's. And she looked up and she saw that it had a point that reached toward the sky. And she was looking up at it when an old man sauntered over to her and says, beautiful, isn't it? Yes, said Jane. What is it? This, said the old man. Oh, this our pride and joy. This is our shoe manufacturing establishment. You mean you make shoes in there, said Jane? No, 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 says the old man. Don't be silly. No, this is where we talk about making shoes. We have a staff of people that we pay to speak to us every week about shoe wearing. And sometimes they are so meaningful, so poignant, so direct that we walk out weeping and Committed to wearing shoes in the week ahead. Jane, looking down at the man's feet, says to him, well, you go here? Yes, said the man, every single week. Well, then why don't you wear shoes? That's the question, said the man. Why don't I? But before she could ask another question, she noticed just over the man's shoulder a small cobbler shop across the street. And she ran over to the cobbler shop, and it said open. She went in the door, and sure enough, there was the old cobbler putting the finishing touches on a beautiful pair of shoes. But he was the only person in that shop. And Jane said to the cobbler, why isn't your shop run over? There are ev Nobody here seems to be wearing any shoes. And the cobbler said to Jane, well, miss, uh, that's the thing. Everybody in the city just wants to talk about wearing shoes. No one actually wears them. Just then, Jane had an idea. She bought as many pairs of shoes as she could carry, and she ran across the street, and sure enough, there that old man was still standing in front of that beautiful stone building, the shoe manufacturing establishment, and she said, good news, sir, I have shoes for you. She threw them at the man's feet, and she said, I bought every shape and size, all different colors. Surely there is a style, a pair of shoes that will work for you. The man looked down at the shoes and then back up at Jane and then back down at the shoes and then back up at Jane and his face growing a little crimson. He says to Jane, I'm sorry, miss, it's just not done. Why don't you wear any shoes, said Jane. That's the question, said the man. Why don't And as Jane traveled back from the city of everywhere to here, that question echoed in her mind. Why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we? Jesus was standing on a hill, giving the sermon of his life, before he would give his life as the sermon. He began poetically, perhaps you know this part, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, we forget that one sometimes, blessed are the meek. And then he gets to the meat of the sermon, or shall we say, the seasoning. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, if we're honest, that's sort of a weird thing to say. It's a bizarre thing to say, but we recognize what he was doing. See, Matthew is having Jesus pause here at the very beginning of his ministry, right smack dab in the middle of his sermon, to remind those around him those reading him, those who will gather in places like this for years to come, of who they were. You are the salt of the earth. To be clear, he was not speaking 
literally. Sometimes we forget that part. He was not saying we are sodium chloride. He is saying you are the salt of the earth. He's speaking theologically, that is, making a claim about who we are, that we are people of worth. And let's be honest, sometimes we need that reminder, don't we? After all, from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to bed, we live in a world that tries to convince us otherwise, that tries to tell us over and over and over again that we are not enough, that who we are is not enough, that we don't look like we should, that we don't talk like we should, that we aren't enough. But it's not true. And we can't do anything else in our faith until we pause to remember that we have worth. Jesus is here saying that you are more than your Twitter followers, that you're more than your Facebook friends, you're more than your Instagram likes, that you are more than the jobs you work, the cars you drive, the houses you have. You are more than your bank accounts, your voter registration cards. You are the salt of the earth. You have worth, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. And in case nobody's ever told you, let me remind you, you are, as I am, a child of God. All of us, young and old, black and white, gay and straight, male and female, rich and poor, broken and whole, we are all children of the same God. But once we recognize that truth, it's just the first step. Then we have to live like it matters. Jesus says to the crowd, Matthew has Jesus says to the, say to this crowd, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, its saltiness, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. We know what this is like as well. We know that in those moments when we try and define our worth based on those more fleeting things of life, sex or money or accomplishment, it can quickly feel like the world is walking all over us. Maybe some of us are there this morning. The good news is that even then, we have worth. You see, salt and in addition to being a preservative in the ancient world and a form of currency, hence something not being worth its salt, save that for double jeopardy, it was also the most common leveling agent used for outdoor fuel at the time. Which, of course, we know the most common use of outdoor fuel at the time was manure. That's right, thanks so much for having me. Manure, that is, salt was added to manure patties to help them burn longer, hotter, and more evenly. And then, when they were used up, the solid charred remains were then thrown out into the muddy roads, where then people would use them to help absorb mud. In other words, they were literally trampled upon and still had worth. Same thing is true for us. And while it might not feel that great to think about ourselves as this solid charred remains of manure patties, think for a moment about what it would mean for us to be the leveling agents for this world. To not only be the people who preserved the message that Christ came to share, but the people who spread it evenly to all of this world. What if we spread that message of love to this world to all in such a way that it made the path a little easier for those who came after us? In other words, friends, what would it mean if we wore the shoes we talked so much about? The truth is, Christians have not been very good at this, not lately, but perhaps not ever. Today is the one-year anniversary of Charlottesville, that moment when all of those cloaked in racism, too many of which proclaimed the name of Christ, forgetting the message he came to share. What has been the Christian witness in response to that? 
What has been the Christian witness over these last few years as we've seen all the xenophobia and racism and homophobia and all of those other things that have trickled up through and into the zeitgeist? What has been the Christian witness? What here at the end of the summer, which has seen parents and children ripped apart from each other, what has been the Christian witness? We are the salt of the earth. Salt is meant to be salty. If we are not willing to stand up to speak out, then who will? When was the last time Christians were known for their love? You are the salt of the earth. But if that metaphor is overdone, then perhaps we can move on to the next one. It's in the gospel. It is simple light. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket but on a lampstand so that it might give light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God. In heaven. So just in case you've missed it, here's the point. Light is meant to shine. We're not a people who get together to just talk about light. We're a people who shine it. We're not a people who get together to talk about shoes. We wear them. Or to drop the metaphor for a moment, we're not a people who just get together to talk about life. We live it. And the only way to do it is through love, full stop. I give you a new command that you love one another. The truth is it's so easy to get cynical about faith, to look around at all the trappings of religion and think this is all a bunch of manure, and you know what? Most of the time, we're right. Because the truth is, our faith is only as good as those people who are willing to live like this matters. And friends, make no mistake, we are living in a moment where it matters. It takes being willing to stand up when we want to sit down, to go when we want to stay, to speak when we'd much rather just stay silent. But it also means life, not at death, but right now. For too long, we've convinced ourselves that our faith is about what happens when we die, when the opposite is the case. Our faith is about what happens when we live right now. That's the kingdom of heaven that Matthew is talking about. What is it in your life, friends, that is worth dying for? Isn't it worth living for as well? The great Howard Thurman used to say, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and then go and do that. Because what this world needs people who have come alive. And if it feels too overwhelming to try and change the entire world, how about we start with the part we have some control over? Ourselves. If we can work to make the interactions we have with other people a little more loving, if we can practice a little grace, a little compassion, a little forgiveness, if we can take a step towards another person who thinks a little differently than us, if we can build a little kingdom of heaven here, then there just might be hope for those cities of everywhere. But if in our travels through life, after looking in the mirror, we discover we don't love like we should. Then we owe it to ourselves to ask that hard question. Why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we? Maybe. It's time to put on our shoes. Amen. 
Go now out in the world to do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the times you can, to all the places you can, to all the people you can, so long as ever you can. Go, friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, and don't forget your shoes. Amen. Amen.